Okay, thank you uh, very much, Sebastian, and thank you also very much all the organizers, uh, the many that there are. It's really a pleasure to, uh, to finally be there. I haven't visited this institute before, and it's really way long overdue, so I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, also to be uh, presenting uh, our work uh, at this uh, symposium about salary machineries. So we are uh, a group of primarily biophysicists, and we're interested in uh, biophysical aspects of the cytoskeleton, specifically the microtubal cytoskeleton. And over the years we've uh, devised experiments in which we can show that uh, dynamic microtubules, uh, growing and shrinking ones, can generate forces, and I will show some of these uh, older data. But we're now also interested in seeing how far we can sort of take these simplified systems and bottom up uh, build something uh, in a confined geometry, which is the topic of today, specifically micro uh, uh, um, microfluidic emulsion droplets, build a structure that starts to resemble a mitotic-like spindle. So, it's, uh, it's, you know, there's a giant disclaimer at the beginning, we're not really reconstituting complete mitotic spindles yet, but we're start, starting step by step, starting with microtubules that are dynamic uh, to get to these structures. And I will talk uh, today about how far we gotten in, we've gotten in that uh, story. So the work I'm going to present uh, in these droplets is mostly the work uh, of Sophie Roth. She was a postdoc in the lab until recently, based on work uh, that was done before uh, by a PhD student, Lide Weilan. These are the people who are currently in my lab uh, at the Technical University of Delft. There's uh, PhD students, postdocs, and technicians. And it's Matthijs Vleugel who is working on this project uh, right now. And we're doing this in collaboration in the past with many people, but specifically now and in the future uh, with uh, a group of cell biologists in, uh, uh, in Utrecht, Anna Akmanova, who will speak later in more detail about microtubule dynamics, uh, but also with uh, Sander van der Heuvel and Lucas Kaptein and, and their students. So just some uh, introductions. So the, the microtubule cytoskeleton is a dynamic system. You are probably all very aware. This is a textbook picture of a single microtubule. We'll see more of it later today. Individual microtubules are stiff, hollow structure that grow by adding tubulin subunits uh, at their ends. And uh, after addition to the ends, they hydrolyze uh, GTP, which is bound to the, to, uh, the polymerizing subunit, to GDP, and that eventually leads to a, a, what's called a catastrophe, where the stabilizing structure here at the end is lost and the microtubules quickly disassembles. Now, this, uh, we've no, we have known that microtubules do this since the early uh, 80s, when it was discovered by Tim Mitchison and Mark Kirshner, but many of the details of how it works exactly uh, we're still very much uh, working on uh, with a large, uh, many uh, groups of scientists. So for, for us, what's very interesting about these dynamic microtubules is that they can generate forces. So for example, you see this uh, uh, fishing yeast cell in interface, and uh, what you do not see in this, uh, in this movie, uh, there's, the, there's the nucleus in the middle of this cell, and microtubule nucleation sites are connected to the nuclear membrane, and from these nucleation sites, uh, they grow with their plus ends towards the cell end. And when they arrive at the cell ends, they continue to grow for a while. And because they are stiff structures, they can generate forces. And these are important to keep at uh, the nucleus in the middle of the cell. M um, shrinking microtubules can also generate forces. So if you go from a pushing situation where you can just uh, you know, generate the force against some object that you run into, like a cell cortex or, or a chromosome for that matter, when you switch to a shrinking state, provided that you hook up this shrinking end to something, and I will uh, show later that this can, for example, be motor proteins at the cortex, then the shrinkage of this filament can also generate a force, in this case, uh, a pulling force. And these uh, have been known to be important, for example, uh, during anaphase in, uh, in mitosis, when chromosomes are moved apart towards the two daughter cells. Uh, shrinking filaments hooked up to kinetochores can mediate shrinking forces, uh, uh, pulling forces, sorry, but also uh, shrinking microtubule ends that hook up to the cell boundary of uh, C. elegans embryos. This is a picture taken by Stefan Grill when he was in Tony Hyman's lab. Uh, can, can generate pulling forces that in this case contribute to the positioning uh, of the spindle within the confinement of the cell. So I'm just summarizing. So we've been interested in first uh, since many years in just understanding and measuring these forces for single microtubules. So what we can do is we can use microfabrication techniques, clean room techniques, where we make artificial barriers, just glass walls in this case, or plastic, with nothing else. And then we can stick single microtubule pieces, nucleation sites, to the glass cover slip. 
and observe the buckling of growing filaments as they generate forces against these walls. Very similar to what you just saw in the fishing yeast and measure these forces. We can also use uh, optical tweezers and that has the ad added advantage that we can now let a short filament that doesn't buckle run into a barrier and then from the displacement of the bead in the trap, which is hooked up to this nucleation site, at nanometer resolution, not only measure the forces, but also follow the, uh, the dynamic properties of the microtubule. So this is uh, pushing forces. We, there's about a few piconewton that you need uh, to stall a single microtubule under these conditions. We've also used these similar techniques to study uh, pulling forces, specifically the ones that are mediated by connections uh, to a barrier where uh, the molecular motor dynein is attached. So this is uh, what's believed to be responsible for the force, pulling force generation and uh, C. elegans. So uh, in C. elegans embryos, but also in other systems like in budding yeast, uh, cytoplasmic dynein can be associated with the cell cortex, regulated by lots of other factors, which we are in our experiments completely ignore. And then when a shrinking uh, filament is hooked up to uh, these complexes at the soil cortex, it can generate pulling forces on the centrosomes. And we rebuild this in a very simple way. Uh, this is what Liedewey Laan did by taking, again, microfabricated barriers, uh, made of gold in this case. And then with uh, surface chemistry, we can specifically coat these gold barriers and nothing else in the sample. And then hook up uh, biotinylated dynein molecules uh, that, uh, that we this we did in a collaboration with uh, Samara Peterson and Ron Vale, and then create a very simple, simplistic artificial barrier where when microtubules uh, hook up with these motor proteins, uh, pooling forces can be generated. So this is what you see. Uh, we have a gold barrier, dynein with biotin and streptavidin attached to this barrier, dynamic microtubules that in this case are nucleated by a centrosome, and we show in these experiments that this connection, first of all, stabilizes the microtubule dynamics. So in this experiment, they do lo no longer seem to either grow or shrink. But we can repeat this same uh, uh, setup in an optical tweezer experiment. And I'm just showing you the, uh, the fancy picture and not the real data. And, and demonstrate that if you take a bead, hook it up to a, a dynamic microtubule, let it interact with dynein, which is active here at the wall, then as soon as you get microtubule shrinkage, this complex together without anything else uh, can sustain pooling forces of a few piconewton, which in this case uh, pull the bead towards the barrier. So this is all old news. We know that microtubules can generate forces. Uh, we can take just pure microtubules without anything else, without any regulatory factors, and measure how large these forces are. But then we're also interested in how they, these forces contribute to positioning of structures, cytoskeletal structures in the cell, specifically uh, the mitotic spindle, but also, for example, the nucleus in fission yeast that I just showed. So the next questions we, uh, we've been asking is if we now take an organizing center that nucleates microtubules in different directions and we close it, put it in a confined space like uh, you see in vivo in, in fission yeast or in the C. elegans embryo, can these pushing and pulling forces that are generated at the cortex uh, be accountable for the positioning of these structures? So what we would like to understand is uh, under what circumstances is pushing enough to put something in the middle of the cell and why under certain other circumstances you may need uh, pulling forces to establish this reliable positioning. So for that, uh, we again re have relied on microfabrication techniques, first just with single esters. So this is again summarizing some of that work. Uh, we can again, uh, using clean room techniques, make in this case sort of square swimming pools uh, that are flat uh, in glass. And then we can uh, use tricks to put gold edges in these chambers, again, uh, so that we can confine or we can target molecular motors specifically to the edges of these swimming pools and, and nowhere else. And then we can d compare if we put molecular motors here or not, uh, whether these single esters for the moment are able to find the position of these uh, square chambers. And we, we showed that if you do not have any molecular motors, then the microtubules will simply push when they reach the cell boundaries. And they can position a single centrosome in the middle of the cell. But we also showed that if you uh, grow microtubules too long, then they start to bend and buckle because they're not infinitely stiff. And eventually, this becomes an unstable situation where the centrosome slowly moves off to the side. Uh, 
This can uh, be prevented uh, in different ways. You can make the microtubules very dynamic so that they never grow very long. Or you can make the system, the chamber, quite small such that the stiffness is higher and they don't buckle as easily. So the message here is that given the right circumstances, pushing forces are capable of putting an ester in the middle of a, of a confined space. Now, if you have a larger system or you want to have long microtubules, then it helps to additionally put motor proteins. That's what you see in this chamber. So if we now put molecular motors, the edges, so we allow no longer only pushing forces to be generated, but also pulling forces by uh, thinking filaments that interact with motor proteins here, then in these larger chambers, we actually get a much more reliable positioning of these esters. So, and uh, again, it's summarizing all data, but you can then uh, do theoretical models of this and really carefully check uh, if you vary both the number of motors and, the, for example, the average length of the microtubules, find in which uh, places of this parameter space uh, you can get reliable positioning in the middle or not. So it taught us a lot about how this um, uh, balance of pushing and pulling forces can lead to faithful positioning. Now that's all uh, nice and then uh, in, you know many or several years ago when we did this many people of course pointed out to us that uh, most cells are not square, some are flat but certainly not square so we were very interested in repeating these experiments also in three dimensional uh, spherical geometries which was a bit harder using these techniques. So that's when we uh, switched to uh, microfluidic techniques so I'm just showing you here a summarizing picture of a technology that many people uh, use. We actually learned it from Patrick Tablen's lab in Paris, but it's used by many people, where instead of using uh, clean room techniques to make hard chambers in glass or plastic, we now make uh, PDMS uh, uh, molds and then use these molds to make microfluidic uh, droplets. So this is a picture of, of such an experiment where we have uh, in PDMS a pattern, when you zoom out, that looks like this where we can put in at different inlets either oil with uh, lipids dissolved in it or water with proteins dissolved in it. And then if you zoom in on where these two different channels meet each other, you see that the, oops, uh, the water that contains proteins, and I'll show you another picture in the next slide, is pushed into an oil phase which is coming here from the sides and that leaves behind little water droplets of uh, 20, about 20 micrometers in size, or any size you want, but that's the size that we like. And in these droplets, which are now uh, have a boundary with a monolayer of lipids, we can enclose again centrosomes and tubulin and look uh, for ester positioning. Uh, we can uh, also put tiny molecular motors on the edges of these uh, droplets again uh, by uh, using not only uh, normal lipids but some of them biotinylated and then we use the same streptavidin and biotinylated dynein uh, to, uh, to, to hook up the dynein to the edges. So this is just an older uh, slide showing the same thing but now with some uh, motion. So this is a, an older design where you see now more clearly that we have these two phases buffer with proteins and oil, you push them together and here is an example where we just put in a, a dye and you see very nicely that you can not only make droplets all of the same size but also loads of them and you can take, pick up these, uh, these droplets from the, from the outlet here and put them under a confocal microscope for example and it works very well with uh, tubulin uh, so this is shown here, it's very gentle on the protein and uh, we can uh, make uh, lots of droplets where tubulin happily polymerizes uh, into uh, microtubules. Now we repeat the same experiment as before, so we now have uh, centrosomes uh, enclosed with uh, radiating microtubules and we put or not um, uh, dynein molecular motors in the site. And again, we, d we do this in parallel with theoretical modeling in the same geometry in collaboration with uh, Frank Juliger's group in Dresden. And uh, we showed that uh, in these spherical uh, chambers, uh, pushing actually in almost all cases leads to A-stable uh, positioning. So as soon as the microtubules grow long, uh, you get the buckling filaments and the centrosome more or less always sits at the edge of this uh, so in this three-dimensional spherical geometries, you really have to fine-tune the parameters for pushing forces to be able to put this thing in the middle. Most of the time, it doesn't work. Now you put dynein at the edges, and we recover the same uh, result that we had before in this geometry. This is now a GFP labeled dynein, so you can see it sitting on the edges. And you nicely get uh, this centrosome to be pulled towards the center because of the pulling forces that are generated at the center, so at, the, at the cortex. So uh, 
under, again, these conditions in this geometry, uh, pooling is a really uh, efficient way of getting a single centrosome in the middle of a droplet. But I promised you to talk about spindle-like geometry. So once you have a single um, ester positioned in the middle, it's now very tempting to see what happens to two. So if you take no motors on the edge and you just have two esters, this is what happens. So we find, again, when microtubules grow long enough, that both centrosomes will sit at the edges of these droplets, but they repel each other. So there's some steric interaction, some interaction force between the two esters that you can also estimate based on a theoretical modeling, which puts these two centrosomes always on more or less exact opposites uh, in the uh, in the droplet. So that's already a first step, you could say, towards bipolarity, even though it's a completely naive system uh, compared to a real spindle. And then you ask, okay, if I now have a uh, a repulsion force that puts these things on the side, and I add uh, a centering force by putting dynein on the edge, uh, you may ask how do these two forces compete, and what we nicely observe is that uh, you get a steady state situation where there appears to be a balance between repulsion forces trying to pull these, push these things apart, and centering forces due to dynein at the cortex that find an equilibrium somewhere uh, at, a, at a fixed distance between the two. So they're not both in the center, they're not both at the edge, uh, but they find a, a nice uh, middle position. And uh, you can be a bit more subtle about this. Uh, this is just repeating. If you do not put motor proteins, you actually can also get this bipolar uh, situation, but then the microtubules need to be relatively short. So you have to fine tune again the parameters as soon as the microtubules uh, are very short, of course, they don't feel each other, and when they are very long, they uh, inevitably uh, push each other apart. And this is, uh, then can then be uh, counteracted by adding dynein, uh, which is what I just showed you. Okay, so this is very nice. I think we, we sort of have a handle on, on, on the understanding of how pushing and pulling forces in this specific geometry uh, balance each other. Uh, we cannot do experiments you know, all over parameter space, so we have to do this in combination with theory where we can tune the parameters more precisely and really show how robust compared to the different parameters that are in the system you expect to get this, uh, this kind of uh, configuration. And like I said, you find that as soon as you have both pushing and pulling, you get very robustly get this uh, interaction and this distance between them. You can, for example, show uh, that the force, the repulsion force, goes up really steeply as soon as you put them closer together. So this is quite a stable situation. Whereas if you want to get to this situation just by tuning the microtubule dynamics, it's much more subtle. So this is what we learn from these kind of experiments. But real spindles, of course, are much more uh, complex. So. Um, so now, you know, how far do we want to go? We know that uh, real spindles do not only depend on dynamic microtubules. This is a, a picture of, uh, taken by Alexei Kodjakov, uh, where you see a nice uh, full-blown uh, spindle organized uh, as it is just before an anaphase. And there's, you know, uh, very well that there's many other factors that are important uh, for the correct organization and positioning of this spindle. There's not just dynamic microtubules. And this is just some cartoons illustrating that by no means uh, complete. There's not only cortical motors that help position this spindle, but there's also motors within the spindle uh, that, that, that can, for example, slide antiparallel microtubules with respect to each other. There's passive cross-linkers, and then, of course, there's the kinetochores themselves, the chromosomes, that also contribute to this uh, spindle. So, so, so what do we do? I, I don't think our goal is to eventually completely build uh, an entire mitotic spindle with all the components that are known to be in vivo. For that, you can better do real cell experiments. But what we would like to do is add some of re the representatives of these other classes of molecules to this simple system that we have and see what do they do, first qualitatively and ideally in combination with theory, also quantitatively. So what, uh, and that's where we sort of uh, at right now. So what, uh, what, we've, what we've added so far is, uh, is summarized in this picture. So I've shown you already the experiments we did in the past with just pushing and pulling microtubules with dynein on the cortex. And the other two uh, mo types of molecules that we've decided to add so far are shown here. So there's an ACE1, which is a representative of an anti-parallel passive crosslinker that can presumably uh, sit here at, uh, at the sort of at the 
uh, at the position between the two centrosomes where anti-parallel microtubules meet, and also uh, kinesin-5 molecules that are again making crosslinks between anti-parallel microtubules and that tend to have the, uh, the effect of pushing these two centrosomes apart. So now we know, of course, very well that these motor proteins can generate forces, but it's also been shown uh, by, for example, uh, work from uh, Stefan Dietz lab and Marcel Janssen that if you put a passive crosslinker between anti-parallel microtubules, that can also effectively generate a force because uh, it's energetically favorable to make these overlaps as large as possible so that these molecules have as much space as possible. So that can actually uh, provide a force that push, pulls these two uh, centrosomes together. So we see, we add it to our experiments and, and ask uh, what happens. So this is now a same experiment that I showed you uh, before, uh, but without any dynein at the moment. So we have two esters uh, with just long microtubules and nothing else. Uh, the control where there is no ACE1 and we recover the same uh, effect. So you get a bipolar spindle geometry with the two centrosomes all the way at the edge. Now, if you start adding ACE1, if you just put a little bit of ACE1, you actually pull these two centrosomes together by the effect that I just mentioned. So you now get again to a fairly spindle-like geometry, but for a completely different reason. We did not put any dynein here, we just put this anti-parallel crosslinker. If you now put a lot, uh, uh, whatever that means, but in a high ACE1 concentration, you pull these centrosomes even further apart, you get very tight overlaps, and now these long buckling microtubules actually start to destabilize the structure again. So you can pull these things together, but it's again fine-tuning, because if you add too much, now you pull them too much together, more than you would with the dynein, and everything uh, goes off uh, to the side. Um, then, how can we repair this? So then we, in addition to the, parallel, the passive crosslinker ACE1, at these high ACE1 conditions, we also add uh, the EG5, and now again you get a balance of forces, where the ACE1 is trying to pull these two together, the EG5 is trying to push them apart, and we, do that, we, we did not titrate this EG5 uh, a lot yet, but you see very clearly that something completely different happens. Uh, you go from a situation where the two centrosomes sit very much at the edge of the droplet, where they again make a bipolar configuration, but now it's a distance which is much larger than before. So all this... Uh, to say that even if this is a very naive and simplistic system, you can already start to see that you know, there's different solutions uh, to, to solving a problem, and it's sometimes, for some parameters, you have to tune them very uh, subtly to get a certain effect, whereas for others, uh, you get very robust effects. And, uh, and like I said before, so we are, of course, very far uh, from, from a real spindle. This is a completely a naive system. It's still uh, uh, you know, very primitive. But I think you can, or we'd like to believe that you can use this kind of experiments as a platform to really ask now what are these different uh, kinds of molecules adding to the balance of forces. And really uh, bottom up understand eventually in a quantitative way, and we're not there yet, uh, you know, which, uh, which parameters have which effect in what context. Because the experiments that we do, anything we add or, or leave out, of course, has an effect in the context of that experiment, which is very different from a real uh, spindle where many other molecules will be present as well. So you have to also be careful in making uh, a real uh, comparison. Still, you can start to, you know, play games, mind games a bit like this. If we now, let's say that this is our spindle. Uh, it has dynein at the cortex, it has ACE1 in the middle, and it looks like a happy bipolar spindle, and now I start to make mutations. So, for example, uh, I take out ACE1. And, uh, you know, if you just look at the distance between these two centrosomes, nothing uh, seems to happen, so it doesn't really apparently play a role. But I could exact get the exact same effect by just taking out dynein. I again get two centrosomes at a certain distance from each other, uh, so the, the result is the same, or actually all three pictures still look the same, even though uh, uh, I've, I've removed each of the two components uh, in these two experiments. This uh, is true, uh, what I just said, except if there was happened to be a lot of ACE1, because if I go from this situation, I remove dynein in the context or under the conditions where there's a lot of ACE1, which is actually the case in this experiment, now you get a very different effect. So removing dynein, 
uh, has very different effects depending on how active uh, ACE1 was uh, to begin with. Even you could not tell that in the beginning. Now, if you remove both, coming either from this situation or this situation, you do not have ACE1 or dynein anymore. You completely lose this uh, attraction between the two centrosomes and you sit at opposite poles of the droplet again. Unless you also, at the same time, maybe not knowing it, have changed the dynamics of the microtubules a bit. Because if the microtubules happen to be shorter on these conditions, you again go back to this bipolar situation. So putting it in reverse, if you start from a situation with no associated factors, just two esters that are pushing each other uh, to the periphery of these droplets, there's now three different ways already in this very simple system by which you can put uh, these two centrosomes closer to each other. You could put a little bit of ACE1, you could put dynein at the cortex, or you just make the microtubules more dynamic and thereby shorter. So very different parameters with exactly the same effect already in this very simplified uh, context. And again, these effects would probably be different if you had the full context of a spindle, but I think it's a, uh, for us a nice a starting or platform, as I called it, uh, to, to ask these questions and think about it. Just another example, if I now take a, a situation with a lot of ACE1 and I remove dynein, I completely lose the bipolar uh, positioning, but there's now two ways that I can... Uh, I can uh, sort of recover this or I can fix this. I can either just remove ACE1 and I get uh, separate uh, positions again, uh, or I cannot remove ACE1 but simply AG5 and get the same result. So it's just a simple, another example of the same uh, idea. So that's where we are with these spindles. So uh, like I said, uh, it's tempting to add more, but I think the first thing we should do is really like we did with just pushing and pulling, uh, understand quantitatively also why these effects happen and what you know, in parameter space, are how robust are these areas where, uh, where positioning uh, is faithful or not, and then maybe go on and put in the next uh, 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 molecule. So I have three more minutes, and uh, this is just to show you one other direction that we're heading, so we don't have really results yet, just ideas. And that has to go back, goes back again to the positioning based on cortical pooling forces. So I've shown you that, uh, you know, independent of ACE1 and ACK5, just with cortical pushing and pulling forces, uh, we can understand how positioning of single or even double uh, esters uh, occurs. And uh, in all our examples and experiments so far, this, con this considered a completely symmetric situation. But you know uh, probably very well that in the C. elegans embryo, but also in other systems, the spindle is actually able to slightly uh, asymmetrically position itself and you can do calculations so you can take go from a spherical uh, theoretical model and this is again a work from uh, uh, from Rui Ma from uh, uh, Frank Jullich's lab and then uh, assume that there's a slight asymmetric distribution of force generations generators sorry as is suggested to be the case in the C. elegans embryo and predict how much this uh, centrosome will position away from the center and you can do the same thing uh, for two esters in a geometry that also more resembles uh, the, the, the C. elegans embryo which of course is not a perfect sphere but is a more an a, a elongated st structure. So that's what we would also really like to, uh, to build in a simple system. So the question is can we uh, reconstitute these asymmetric force generators in our microfluidic droplets. And there's two things that we have to do. We think first is to change the shape from a spherical to a slightly elongated one. And this is uh, the way we plan to do this. So you can make use these microfluidic chips not only to make spherical droplets, but if you catch them in preformed structures, you can give them basically any shape you like. And here uh, I show you an example where we have a device which we first fill with oil. Uh, which is white, and then we fill it with uh, water and a black dye in this case, but eventually there will be proteins. And then we've made small constrictions here that are hydrophobic so that the oil can pass, but the water cannot. So when water passes, it leaves these oil constrictions alone and, and uses only the bypass. And if you now come with oil again, and this is the second movie, then you empty out all the water channels except for these droplets that are left behind, behind the constriction. And by uh, designing the, the length and the thickness and whatever, the shape of these containers, the way you want, you can make any shape you want. This particular example actually was meant to become a fishing yeast shape, so it's a bit small and elongated. But we're now making a mask that would make this a bit larger and eventually make a droplet uh, 
uh, of roughly these sizes inspired by the C. elegans embryo and then put double uh, esters in there uh, to see uh, how they position themselves. And then the next thing would be to try to recruit force generators a symmetrically to these droplets. So for now we just throw in biotin and streptavidin everywhere. And the way we want to do this, and this is the last picture I'll show, uh, is using this light inducible domain. So this is a collaboration with uh, Lucas Capitain uh, and his student Roderick uh, and Anna Manova, where we do not put uh, biotin dynine directly on the lipid, but we put in between uh, two of these peptides that you can activate with light such that they make a connection only uh, when you shine light. And then uh, we, uh, what we would like to try is to shine light on these droplets uh, only on one side and see if we can recruit molecules uh, specifically to that side. Of course, we will have to beat diffusion, so we'll see if that works. If necessary, we would go back to these chambers where diffusion does not play a role and, uh, and that aspect should be faster. So this is, for the moment, just plants. Uh, we, uh, we're making the proteins and we have the gels, but uh, nothing like this is working yet. With that, I want to stop. I want to uh, acknowledge the many people we collaborate with that help us, uh, specifically uh, the people that I've mentioned on the Esther Positioning Project. And I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>